Thank you for attending the Digital Teaching Symposium and welcome to the session on fostering student engagement in your remote course. I'm Monica Hill, Blackboard Clients Experience Manager, and I'm going to be your facilitator today. I've been with Blackboard since September of 2017, and I have over 25 years of experience in academia. I started as my career as a professor of English as a Second Language, Freshman English, and Developmental Reading and Writing. And I've also worked as an instructional designer of online programs and in program evaluation for online programs. With me today are two of my colleagues from Blackboard, and they will introduce themselves in the chat. Today, we're going to talk about some of the differences between remote teaching and online teaching. We're going to discuss the need to think in a new modality as we get deeper into remote teaching. And we're going to look at some of the tools within LEARN that you can use to help drive student engagement in your course. And also we'll look at how you can leverage the mobile apps. And we'll look at some of the interactive tools and collaborate. We'll also have time at the end for an open question and answer session. Also today, my colleagues and I are going to be answering your questions in chat. So as we go through the presentation, please share any questions, comments, feedback in the chat, and my colleagues and I will do our best to answer them. And again, at the end, we'll have time to answer any questions we didn't get to or any other questions that come up. Now, remote teaching is very different from teaching online. And I think when we think about remote teaching, we really are thinking about something that is an emergency response and really was designed to be temporary. Remote teaching is about having that continuity of education in unexpected circumstances. So when we go into remote teaching, we really are thinking about the critical communication and interaction we need with our students for them to be successful in our courses. And generally in remote teaching, the setup is pretty rapid and our focus is on making sure that the content and communication channels are reliably available to our students. Now, online teaching has some very, very different expectations. Online courses usually take six to nine months to plan, and the roles for students and instructors are very clear because in online learning, a big thing to keep in mind is online learning is usually the selected learning modality by both the instructor and the student. The instructor decides to teach an online course, and the student decides to enroll in the online course. And there are very clear quality design principles for online courses as well. And I would say it typically takes two to three semesters to truly master an online course and for it to be really finished in an online course. So today, what we're really focusing on is remote teaching. We're really talking about what you need to do to keep your students who are accustomed to coming to your classroom and seeing you, your, your a couple of times a week, how to keep them engaged in these situations. But it's important though to understand those, those differences between remote teaching and online teaching, and also to understand the expectations that at this time, no one is really expected to develop a fully online course. We're still doing remote teaching and we still are unsure of what the environment is going to be. So I like to share this image because this is how we all felt in the spring of 2020, and many of us still feel this way now, this frantic dash to transition from our face-to-face -face courses to remote teaching. And so it was very fast-paced, and we didn't have a lot of time to get used to it. And many of us are finding ourselves now kind of in this situation again, because maybe our, our campuses started back with face-to-face -face or started back with hybrid, and now we're finding that we have to change things a little bit, or as we're going along, we're just seeing what's working and what's not working. But now that we have this ongoing remote teaching as we adapt to a new normal that we, don't, we aren't sure what it's going to be, we have the opportunity to be a little bit more mindful in planning our remote courses than we were able to be in the spring. And we have a chance to get to understand those differences. And we've had some experience, too, to help us see those differences in modality between teaching remotely and teaching on campus. 
We also have a little bit of time to get a little more familiar with the technology and to consider how some of those principles of effective online course design can be used to enhance the student experience. And I ask now too, if you would like in the chat, just to share some of the differences you've already noted or experienced from teaching remotely from when you teach on campus. That would be um, interesting for us to, to discuss as we do that. Now, before we start talking about some of the ways to keep your remote students engaged, I wanna talk just at a very high level and just very briefly about some of the basic principles of online course design. And having these principles in mind can help with understanding some of the things we can do to enhance our interaction and enhance engagement when we're not seeing our students in the classroom all of the time. If you were in the earlier session today on um, the exemplary course program and um, the winners of that, you may have seen some of these principles um, highlighted there as well. But one of the things that is critical in online course design is you always start with the end in mind. And many of us do this already, even when we're designing our face-to-face -face courses, but in online course design, it's more explicit with that. So we think about what are our instructional goals, what do we want users to, what do we want our students to do in the course, and how they're going to show that they accomplish this, and how are you, what things are you going to provide your students to help them accomplish this. And as I said, of course, we do this in our face-to-face -face courses as well. But one of the differences in online courses, all of these things are planned ahead of time. And so we're going to look at four principal areas that online courses are evaluated on. And that's course design, interaction and collaboration, assessment, and learner support. Now, course design, in an online course, when we're doing an evaluation, we make sure that there are clear goals and objectives. We look at the content composition and structure, how learner engagement is there, how the technology is used, and accessibility. And I know a lot of you are probably thinking right now, well, of course I do that in my face-to-face -face course. The difference is in your face-to-face -face course, other than goals and objectives, you usually don't have to explicitly demonstrate to someone else the other things. You don't have to demonstrate your content and composition or your learner engagement because those things come out as you're meeting with your students on um, a regular basis. Interaction and collaboration are also important in looking at online course design. Are there clear communication strategies? Is there a development of a learning community in this online course where your students are geographically dispersed perhaps? And are the logistics clear for the interaction? And of course, assessment is also important. Are the learner expectations very clear and explicit? And how is the assessment designed? And are the opportunities for learners to self-assess? And learner support is one of the really big areas that differs in online courses because these things tend to happen more naturally in a face-to-face -face course. And for students who are coming to campus, you take care of a lot of this when you see them in class or they take care of it on campus. But when it comes to being um, an online student, orientation to the course and to the learning management system is very important knowing how to get in touch with the instructor and what the how to communicate with you is important for the students knowing the course and institutional policies and how they can get support is important and also just what technical things are available for them for accessibility for their learner support and how they will receive and get feedback now today we're really going to look at of the interaction and collaboration and the learner support pieces, because those are the areas where we're really going to see that enhancement in student engagement. And that's, that's what we're gonna talk about, some of the tools to do those things. And now it's good to have in mind some of those principles of online learning, because they'll help us see how we can use some of these tools in our remote course to make the experience better for our students. Now, when I talk about thinking in a different modality, I'm thinking here about the difference between being physically face-to-face, -face, coming to the class every day, and being remote. And I think one of the critical things to keep in mind, just like this was thrust upon us, it was thrust upon the students as well. So the virtual experience versus the in-person experience is very, very different for the students. And many of our students did not choose it. 
And I think that's an important distinction for us to keep in mind that our students who registered and enrolled in face-to-face -face courses and then had to go remote, many of them are feeling academically homeless right now because their safe place to come to study, their place to get access to the materials and resources and often the technology that they need for their courses was your campus. And they didn't choose an online learning experience. They wanted that experience of being physically sitting in the classroom, being with the faculty member, being with those other students, having all of that access. So right now, many of them are also very frustrated and very confused. Many students have access issues where they might not be able to um, have access not only to the technology, but also just to a safe and quiet place to study. And so that is also a challenge for many students. Many of them are facing other challenges related to the pandemic going on as well. They're impacting um, their ability to focus on their courses. Um, feedback that we've gotten from students of what, how they're reacting in remote learning, one of the things that they miss the most is interaction not only with faculty members, but with other students. So students really feel that loss of being able to interact regularly with their classmates as well. Many students say it's difficult to stay on track when they're not coming to campus because they had their regular meetings with their faculty members, they knew when their classes were, they knew when to be prepared, they had that positive peer pressure of not wanting to be unprepared in class for class discussions and activities, and now it's much more difficult without having that. Some students struggle with figuring out how the technology works because some of them were not familiar with it before. And some are not still not clear on faculty expectations of what they're supposed to do, when they're supposed to do it. And many students feel like they really appreciate it when their faculty are aware of the challenges that they face and that they really feel that faculty need to be flexible with them as they adapt to this as well and try to meet the expectations and meet the class requirements. Another thing that many students mentioned is that they don't like it when classes become 100% asynchronous. So while in remote teaching, you, those asynchronous techniques are useful, they like to, to have that interaction with their faculty member and with other students. And also many students have a hard time accessing support services as well with that. So those are some of the things to keep in mind that the students are going through right now. And like I said, I like to use the metaphor of them being academically homeless because many right now don't have a place to go to have access to computers, to the internet, to study resources as well. Their place to go was campus and the public libraries, many coffee shops, other places they may have gone are closed. Some of them who were working students may not be going into the office anymore. Maybe they did their work at, at work. And so that's a challenge for them as well. And many, many students talk about dealing with internet and bandwidth issues that we'll talk about more in this session. But as I think about this, as the faculty members, we have all of this going on with our students and then for ourselves as well, because this is all very new to us. And so we struggle with this idea of how do I get to the same student learning outcomes using remote teaching techniques? And that's what we're going to talk about the asynchronous techniques that you can use, including recorded lectures, discussion boards, online assessments, virtual office hours, and a clear communication strategy. So these are all things that can help you achieve those. And we're also going to talk about now some of the interactive tools that are already in the LMS that you can also use to pump up that student engagement. Now, one thing, too, I'd like to point out is even in your face-to-face -face course, it's really a good idea to use the LMS and to use LEARN because it enhances not only the communication between you and the student, it enhances the communications with the students with each other. You can share announcements with the students. Students um, can share their perspectives and learn collaboratively. It makes you more accessible with being able to answer questions to them because you can have a discussion board where they post questions. They can get that information from you right away. And you can send announcements about upcoming due dates or any important information that they need to know as well. So it's a great way to really enhance the communication beyond 
the scheduled class meetings. It also enables student-centered approaches to teaching. You can accommodate different learning preferences. Students can interact more with instructional content that you post on the LMS. And it also gives them that opportunity to explore more and to do a little bit of independent learning as well. And they have 24-7 access to your course materials. So it also kind of removes the reliance on physical attendance for them to keep up with, with coursework. When I um, teach on the ground, I have a no absences policy, which means that I expect students to come to the next course fully, the next class meeting fully prepared because I post all of my lecture notes, um, any recordings that I did in the class, um, all of the upcoming assignments, everything is posted in the LMS. So students know if they miss a class meeting, they can go to the LMS and get everything that happened in class. And so that they are expected to come prepared to the next class as well. So it takes away that reliance on physically being there all the time. It also gives you some just-in-time methods to assess and evaluate your student progress. There are online tests you can give, surveys, discussion forums. When we talk about discussion forums, I'm going to show how you can really use discussion forums to um, not only drive engagement, but also as quick means of assessments. And of course, you have assignments. And another nice thing about the LMS is it makes a lot of the administrative tasks you have to manage your course, it makes a lot of those much easier. Because as I said before, you can post announcements, you can post your handouts and assignments so you don't have to print things out or have your stacks of paper you carry around. If you're using a newer version of Learn, you also have the attendance feature in there so you can take attendance. You can auto grade quizzes. And also you have the grade center, the retention center, and virtual office hours. So that let's take a look at some of these tools and the ones that are really great for driving engagement. So already within your LMS, you have these interactive tools. You have a discussion board, the blog, and the journal are three tools that I really recommend for getting students engaged in your course. And I use all of these in my face-to-face -face and in my online courses um, as well for that to drive engagement. So let's take a look at each one of these and how they work and the differences between them. Discussion forums are most like the discussions that you have live in your class now. So discussion, as you know, you have that social interaction among your students. It's a great way to collaborate. They can ask questions. They can show their understanding of the application. Using the discussion tool and learn is an added benefit because unlike a classroom discussion, students have to participate. So I like to say there's no back row in an online discussion forum. Students have to participate in the discussion and you have a record of their participation in that discussion as well. And it's a good way to drive the engagement. Anytime I have a reading assignment, I always have an accompanying discussion forum. Not only is the way to make sure that the students have read the reading and engaged with it, it also lets me know if they've really understood the reading and if they can apply the concepts. And it gives them a chance to exchange ideas and the perspectives on whatever was in that assignment as well. And as you know, good things about a discussion topic should be open-ended and thought-provoking. There shouldn't be just one way to answer it. It should be something that really lends to a conversation. It's also very important to be very specific about the length and format of the discussion and to have guidelines for posting. I always also make a requirement for students to respond to their classmates. So when I use discussion forums, I make it clear uh, that I want it to be an academic discourse. I let them know whether or not they have to use citations or quotes, like how formal it has to be. And I also give them a guideline for not only how long their initial post has to be, but how long their responses to their classmates have to be. And I set um, deadlines for posting. So I'll usually say if, um, depending on when my class meets, I'll usually have the deadline. If I'm doing a face-to-face -face class or a live synchronous session uh, via Collaborate, I'll usually have the posting deadline um, the day before class meets live. So I have a chance to look at those and we can use those as a springboard in our live discussion as well. 
And um, I'll sometimes, and I also make them respond to each other. And I'll usually tell them you have to respond to two or three other students. I make it very clear. And I give them a requirement for how long those have to be. And because you really want it to be something that's substantive. You don't want them to, to say, oh, I agree. Oh, that sounds great. I really want them to interact with each other's um, statements and comments. So I always give them a requirement for that. And I post a deadline for when they should engage in, in um, the discussion as well, because that helps them to know what they need to do to be active in the class. So the discussion forums really give you that opportunity to still have those classroom discussions and to take it further. Discussion forums are also great to use after your session meets. So if you have a live session, you could always post a discussion topic to give students a chance to ask more questions, follow up on thoughts and ideas that they've had, just to keep that going and driving. And you have the option of grading or not grading discussions. I usually grade mine because I work mainly with undergraduate students, mainly first and second year students. And so I always grade them so I know that they will do them and participate in them. Another great tool that's available is the blog. Now the blog is a web blog and blogs in Blackboard are similar to blogs on the web. So usually on the web, you have blogs where people respond to either experiences, they have they express their ideas freely and they're open and shared with the world. And it's like an online diary that people share with the whole world. In Blackboard, usually it's a response to an assignment that you have and it's assigned by you, the instructor. And as the instructor, you decide um, with whom the blog is shared and are also organized that way. So blog really takes, I know some people like to use, um, in the past I used WordPress or they use other sites where they'll have students write blogs, but you have a blogging tool that you can use right there in Blackboard um, with your students. And there are three different types of blogs available in Blackboard. You have a course blog where you have one blog for the whole course and each person in the course can create entries there and then they can comment on each other's entries as well. You have a group blog where if you're doing a group assignment, a group can have their blog that they can all make comments on as well they can post, make posts and then write comments on. Or you can assign an individual blog for students with that. So you have three different types of blogs you can assign. Now blogs differ from discussions in that the course, dis the discussion forum is more like the classroom discussion. There's more back and forth, more interaction, whereas a, and a blog is more like commenting on an article, image, or video posted on the web. So it's not as much back and forth conversation. Somebody will either post a short piece and then their classmates will comment on it, or they'll share a video that they did or an image. So it's different in that sense. It's, it's not the same deep level of back and forth interaction as you have with the discussion board but it's still a great way to extend their students' learning, to get them engaging with each other, with each other's content as well. And it's something that many of them are already familiar with because they're on social media. So they're very familiar with reading things on social media, looking at videos on social media, and commenting on them and sharing posts. So it's a great way to extend um, something that they're already doing and have them interact more with your content and with each other. There also is a journal feature. The journals are more a self-reflective tool in space, and students can post on their experiences or course topics in a journal, and it's a very safe environment because journals typically are private, so only between the student and the instructor, and only the student and the instructor can make comments on the journal. You can have a group journal, though, so if, you have, if you're using groups, you can assign a journal to a group where journal entries can be read by all of the members of the group as well as you as the instructor. But one of the really great things about journals is they really help students create meaning and internalize their learning as they engage in these one-on-one -on -one conversations with the instructor. I know one instructor who actually used journals as a way for students to help prepare for office hours with her or to see like how they were doing. It was an assessment tool for the students to kind of gauge their own learning throughout the course and to have a safe place to ask for more help, to give feedback, to talk about where they were struggling, to talk about areas that they really felt that they grew in. 
And it was just back and forth between the two of them. So the journal is a really great way to have more personal interaction with the students. The journals are similar to blogs, except, as I mentioned, the journals are really designed for individual self-reflection. They're usually not graded. They can be graded, but they often are not. And the default setting for the journal is for it to be private between the student and the instructor. Now, instructor can make the journal public, but um, student, other students can't comment on it. So even if you make a journal, the journal assignments public, so students can read each other's journal posts, they can't make comments on each other's journal posts. Only you can make comments. So that's another really great tool to use to really get your students more engaged with the content in your class. And it's a little bit of, like I said, a more private space for students to open up if they don't want to share certain thoughts or ideas publicly, they can do it there. Now, groups. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the in this session, one of the things students miss a, a lot about remote teaching is that ability to interact with other students. And even though most students groan and complain when they have group work, we know that there are great benefits to group work. Aside from getting the, the benefits to, of getting other perspectives, you also establish good relationships as good practice for the professional world when they have to work collaboratively, and it helps them improve their communication skills and critical thinking. Now, groups in online courses can be a challenge because your students are geographically dispersed. But within the learning management system, you have tools to make it much easier for you to assign group work to your students, whether you're meeting with them face to face or whether they're meeting, um, um, whether your, their, your course is remote. So within Blackboard Learn right now, there is a groups tool and you can create groups for your students. And with that groups tool, you can actually give each group its own blog space its own discussion board, its own journal, um, an email session so they could send each other emails, a file exchange so they can share documents with each other. They could also assign each other tasks. And one of the things I like the most about the group tool and I find the most useful is that you can also give each group its own Collaborate Ultra meeting room. So if your school is using Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, and you have group assignments, you can actually create a collaborate room for the group to meet in where they're all moderators so they can hold um, synchronous group meetings without all having to be in the same place together and without you having to be there to facilitate it and without you having to manage the room or to create it for them. You just check that box in the groups tool and they have a collaborate room so they can meet and do their group projects together as well. So that's really something to keep in mind that you have the groups tool in Blackboard Learn right now that is really a great way to um, get that interaction with your students. So I encourage you to, uh, if you're doing group projects, to keep doing them and remember you have the groups tool available to you. And my colleagues and I are sharing in the chat some links to where you can get more information on all of these tools that we talked about. Now, Blackboard, we also have the mobile apps, and the mobile apps are very, very helpful for students as well to keep them um, connected to your class. We have the Blackboard app, which is the student app, and that allows students to stay up to date. They can get quick access to course content, see their grades, and they can interact with you and each other on the go. And we have the Blackboard instructor app, that is for faculty, and that allows you to manage courses, send announcements, and connect with students, and, um, and mark some assignments, submissions. Now, it's also really important to keep in mind that today, many students are relying on their mobile apps for connectivity, that they um, use those more than they do their computers, especially with remote learning thrust on them. There are some students who really are heavily having to use their phones or tablets to um, complete their coursework or do that. And we actually have a session on designing for um, mobile learning as part of our instructor webinar series. And I'll share the, the link in the chat 
about that. If you want to learn more about how to design your courses to make them a little bit more mobile friendly for students. But it's really important to keep that in mind that mobile learning can happen in different environments. So you can your students can stay engaged with the content even when they're on the go. They can still um, read their assignments. They can still um, watch videos if you have that. And they can also participate in collaborate sessions from their phones as well. So that is really great to know. Another great thing we mentioned that a lot of students mentioned is a struggle to stay on track with the mobile app. They can get announcements of when things are due. They get reminders that pop up and let them know something's due. As I mentioned, they can send you a message through the app. They can also um, join a collaborate session for your virtual office hours through the app as well. So it's a really great way for them to stay connected and um, stay up to date with what's, what's going on. It also gives you the opportunity as an instructor to remember that, you know what, not every assignment has to necessarily be done on their computer. You can create video assignments where students can create a short video on their phone that they can um, share with the class as well with that. So it lets them use things that they're more comfortable with, they're more used to, and shows that um, it doesn't have to be a barrier. So keep in mind, we have those mobile apps available to use to make um, life easier and students can use their mobile phones. We've been talking about a lot of the asynchronous tools that you can use to enhance interaction in your class. And I wanna shift and talk about some of the things that you can do when you're meeting with your students synchronously in the virtual classroom. And today we're gonna to focus on um, Blackboard Collaborate Ultra and some of the tools that are available within Blackboard Collaborate Ultra that you can use to make your synchronous sessions with your students more engaging and more interactive. Now, keep in mind that your school might not license Collaborate Ultra, so I'm hoping that you still get some ideas of what you can do, even if you might not have these exact tools there in um, the web conferencing system that you use. So one of the really great things about Collaborate Ultra is in the chat feature, we have a very robust library of uh, emojis. And emojis are a great way to get nonverbal feedback from your students. Students are used to using emojis to communicate. So it's a, it's a great way to get them to, like, to break the ice and to share a little bit more about how they're feeling, how they're reacting to something. I like to use it often when I'm giving um, a live session and collaborate. I'll ask a question, ask somebody with, I'll ask the, the participants what their reaction is to something, and they can give those emoji feedback as well to get some some levity to the session, but also it's a way to just make them engage more. It's also a great way to get feedback during the session with that to make sure that they're paying attention or asking that as well. So it's a good way to just get a little bit more of the nonverbal feedback that you can't always get when you're meeting with people remotely. Another great thing is on the attendees panel in Collaborate, in addition to being able to see the role of each attendee, you also have a raise hand feature so you can see when somebody has their hand up. And I like the fact that the raise hand feature really keeps them in order. So you know who raised their hand in what order as well. And so you can also see who has their mic on. You can also get a look at their status or feedback. Like So you can see if somebody has stepped away from the session and you can also see um, but what their connection is. You can see if somebody is having a, a weak connection, you'll see that there as well. So those are all really great things about that. Another thing I love are the attendee controls. So you can send a private chat message to an attendee. You can also promote them to another role. So if, so if I'm doing student presentations, I'll make the student a presenter so presenters can share their screens as well. That. If you have a captioner, somebody to do captions in your class, you can make that person a captioner. You can also mute someone, and you do have an option to remove someone from the session. So say a student is being disruptive, you can remove that student from a session. What happens more often is someone thinks that he or she has left the session early for some reason, but you're hearing a lot of background noise because they left their browser window open, and you can remove them from the session to, to reduce that as well. There also is the attendees panel. You have the ability to detach that attendees panel. So if you click on detach the attendees panel, 
it keeps that panel open all the time. And I like to do that. That way I can see my attendees panel and my chat at the same time. So I can still monitor the chat, see what pe questions people are asking, see what emotions I'm seeing there coming from people. And I can still see my attendees panel, all the raised hands and the reactions, which I'm going to show you. Another thing that a lot of people don't realize is available in Collaborate. If you go to the profile icon and you hover your mouse over there, you have this great menu of feedback. And I like to do these as attendance checks. I'll ask a question to see if students are paying attention and they have to agree or disagree. And there, not only do um, you see the responses, you can see how each student responded and you can see who hasn't responded. You also see there, you have the chance to give, um, ask questions to give feedback about whether they feel happy or sad, if they're confused or surprised by something. And also they can let you know if they need you to go faster or slower over something. So those are great tools that you can use in the synchronous session to promote engagement. We also have polls available in the synchronous sessions. So polls are available in Collaborate. So you can um, ask a poll question, have your students respond to that. And a really great thing is that those are all now saved into the Collaborate scheduler in your Learn Classroom. So when you do a poll, you have the results saved into uh, Collaborate, the scheduler in the Learn Classroom, and you can download the results of those polls. Another fabulous tool within the Collaborate, the synchronous classroom that you can really, you can use to drive engagement is um, the interactive whiteboard and the ability to write on files. So you can share a whiteboard and you can write on the board and students can write on the board. You can draw shapes, draw pictures, write text using the pencil, type in text as well. And there are some great new features coming to the whiteboard in the near future as well. But that's a great way to do brainstorming sessions or have students engage as well. And the same thing if you're sharing an image or a file, you can give the students the ability to mark up the files as well. And it's up to you as the instructor whether or not students can mark on the whiteboard and on the file. So you can change that at any time. So if you don't want them to draw on it, you don't have to, but it's a great way to do brainstorming sessions. And of course, we have the breakout groups. So when you're having a synchronous session and you wanna have smaller breakout groups, you can have uh, breakout groups in the session and your breakout groups still have access to a whiteboard as well and to files. You can also share files to the breakout groups so they can work on those as well. So those are just some of the tools that you have available to you to give a little bit more interaction and interactivity in your synchronous students sessions with your students as well. And so now I am going to ask you if we have any questions and we will be taking those in the chat and I will answer questions live now. Thank you so much for your attention. All right, thank you so much. And now we have a few minutes to answer some of the questions in chat that we might not have um, gotten to. Please continue to post your questions in chat and we will answer in community any that we don't get to today. And also be aware that after this session, we have our networking sessions and one of them is on engagement and I will be there along with some other colleagues. So if you have more, want to continue the conversation, jump into that session. And those networking sessions are designed so that you can go to more than one. So if you want to hit on another topic, you can uh, jump around with those. But um, the first question we have, someone asked if we really need all the bells and whistles of the online platforms or of the basic features of Learn Enough. Really, it depends on the design of your course. What I usually recommend to instructors is do what you're comfortable with and don't add too much at once. I think sometimes we get so excited about everything that's there, we wanna use everything. But really take your time and use what fits the design of your course. And then you can add on things as time goes on if they're useful to helping your students um, meet the, the objectives and goals of your course. But it's not necessary to, to use everything. Really make sure that it's meaningful and that helps students get to the, the learning objectives and outcomes. And um, an example of a blog assignment someone asked for. So I taught um, writing and literature a lot. So usually I would have, just as I mentioned, I always have um, discussions to go along with the readings, but often I would have a longer, more reflective assignment about a blog. So students would have to write 
um, a blog post sometimes based on um, an idea that they got from the discussion forum because we always started the discussion forum was always the first thing that we did you know, talking about the readings. And so I would ask students to um, write more about either a certain work of literature or about um, a topic that came up in the discussion forum to pick that um, topic, do a little research on it and give us um, a summary of what their findings or their opinion on it and post that as a blog. It also works really great in a lot of social sciences courses as well, where you can ask students to write a short article on a topic of, on a hot topic right now. And so I see blogs as more of like when we go online and we read articles that people have posted and then we make comments on them. That's what I use blogs for more. When I want a student, I want students to comment on each other's um, work, but I don't necessarily want the interactivity that you'll get in the discussion forum. And I do recommend that you don't have the blogs too long. So I wouldn't do use a, an essay length assignment. I have an assignment that students can read, like, like reading an article online. So something that is maybe um, you know, 300 to 500 words, no more, no more than that, the max, like maybe 250, something that is more su a more substantive response. Students can comment on each other's responses, but there's not that back and forth interaction with that. And um, suggestions for holding office hours. So I use Blackboard Collaborate, the web conferencing system for office hours. And what I do when I teach multiple sections, rather than trying to use the course room and having to coordinate which class has office hours when, I make um, an office hours link in one of my course sessions. And then I share that link in an announcement. And also I actually create a content area and learn. And I share that link there and um, let students know what my office hours are. So I post my office hours in an announcement with the link in all of my courses. So students can use that link to join my office hours no matter which course they're in. And then I use the breakout rooms. So in the main room, I'll either have a file or a PowerPoint slide up letting, or just use the whiteboard and let students know that they're in the waiting room or in the hallway waiting for their turn. And then one by one, I take them into a breakout room to meet with them, them privately so that we have that, that privacy. So that's a great way to do breakouts. And the next question is, oh, somebody asked about setting up multiple polls in a session. So one of the, um, right now, there's not a way to set up polls in advance and collaborate. So what I do, I actually put my polls on a slide and I'll actually share that when um, we share the PowerPoints from this session, because that was another question, we will share the PowerPoints. And I will take out the rotating gift to make sure that uh, that uh, doesn't irritate people. But um, when I post the, the questions for a poll on a slide ahead of time, so rather than taking the time to set up the polls and collaborate, I just share the slide with a poll question on it. And then I just add the number of responses that are necessary. And I go that way. So it makes it much faster, especially if you're doing more than one poll, to have them either on a slide or a file that you can share. You put up the slide. You give students a couple of seconds to look at it. You go over the features, you hit the start, and then they can respond to um, the poll questions from the slide rather than you having to type it all in. So that's a great time-saving way um, to, to, to do that. And I think that is the last question. So like I said, I would like to remind you that we have our networking sessions um, coming up later um, after this. And we have an, a topic on accessibility with a John Scott. There's a topic on exemplary course program. And there's another session on engaging students. And that's really designed to be networking and interactive. So if you have more comments, I hope you come. And I do hope some of you who posted really great comments in the chat, join us for, for that session as well. And um, I hope to see you more this afternoon. Thank you, everyone.